think. Yeah, we think so. And we did receive a message from Heather, uh, Jarrett, Carrie, Tatillo, McCall Flynn, of course, and, and Sean Scott, that they will not attend today. Julie, can you hear us? Jacob, I'm here. Hi. Can you um, hear me? We can hear you loud and clear, certainly. Uh, you sound you sound excellent today and, and maybe even younger. <laughs> Thank you. Do, do you think uh, with our five task force members, we would consider that a quorum? Or I, I certainly think we can move through and have good discussion and that set us up into a good place, but wondering about the voting we have. So Jacob, I think that's really important that um, given that we're small, we do move through, still have some of the discussion to lead us up for, to next week, but um, we could share what we're going to vote on next week, but I would not hold the voting due to the fact that I'd want more, more of our people there to, to provide their perspective and put their vote in as well. Yes, thank you. All right. <clears throat> well, Virginia, if you wanna go ahead and put the slides up and then take our role um, of our five people, then we'll go ahead and get started. Sorry, we did get one more person joining. Uh, oh, Nick. Well, I'll just start in alphabetical order, uh, Diane. Here, thanks. Thank you. Uh, John. Here. Jewel. Good afternoon. Mike. I am here, good morning, good afternoon. And Nick. Good afternoon. Uh, Sharon. Good afternoon, here. And I think I've got all of the task force members there. It's everybody that's here, welcome everybody. <clears throat> okay, so go ahead and move us through Virginia. Um, we did our roll call today. We will be nice to each other, follow our norms, keep on moving to Virginia, we'll, we'll move efficiently today. <clears throat> so here's our timeline. Let's stop just a second and take a look at this, where we are. So we have two more meetings after this. Um, what we're gonna do today is I, I will walk us through the red line recommendations that we have in place for one and six, I think, uh, to go ahead and give a heads up. <clears throat> there was a slight adjustment to six uh, that we made it, our side adjustment to some of the language in one that we looked at last week. And we think there might be some more as we move into chapter four. So one is probably not even in a place to finalize yet anyway, but six is, but we'll hold off until next week, but we'll walk through what that looks like. And then we're gonna dig into four. <clears throat> and if the task force will bear with me, um, I'm gonna present the table that we looked at a couple of weeks ago with some possible recommendations for obtaining different levels of licenses in, in Montana and try to provide an overview of thinking of some of the adjustments that have been made to see kind of a through line and how they will address many of the pressure points I think we've talked about in the task force up to this point. Um, and I think it'd be very useful twofold to get feedback from each of you on what's there as well as if we see things that we think we're in support of to try and spread the word. Uh, between now and next week too, so that if anybody um, has conversations with other task force members to help provide the context that we talk about today so that um, others are in the know as to what we talk about as well. Excuse me. Uh, next slide, please, Virginia. So go on, what is, uh, can we pull up the red lines 
for chapter six, Virginia. I think that they're on the website. Here we go. Make it just a little bit bigger, Virginia. Is that okay or a little bit more? Maybe you'll just go bigger enough. Let's see what 150 looks like. There we go. I think that's perfect. <clears throat> so all of these we, we did look at last week in chapter six. And from our discussion, we came about removing the language in 601.2 at the bottom that's in red there, um, really related to who could bring a complaint um, <clears throat> about misconduct to the superintendent of public instruction. And previously it had the language about any credible source. And we came to a decision to change that to be the board of trustees at a school district, which was there already and include then or from a county superintendent. Um, so that's in place. Uh, and Mike is in, in support of that. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. I, I will say I know that uh, Julie and Crystal put this before legal and uh, at OPI, and they, of course, thought that the language was there. They, they wanted to make sure that the uh, intent of the task force was really to limit it to the county superintendent. Uh, and because what it does is limit the number of sources who could bring it forward. And my, my takeaway was that that's what we wanted to do was sort of just really make sure it had to go through local channels first. <laughs> so that'll be something that we bring back up next week. Keep on scrolling down for me, Virginia. This was the language uh, related to the legalization of marijuana in the state that was going to be removed. Uh, that's a direct recommendation from the legal department. And then Sharon's recommendation for clarification that we make it explicitly clear what board is being referenced, uh, which is the Board of Public Education, which is very useful. And then McCall had the recommendation 607. Uh, about uh, allowing for notification to be made via email, uh, which seems intuitive to me uh, in today's day and age. So that's, that's, that's six. Those are the adjustments we'll make and we'll vote on those next week. <clears throat> I don't think there's another one. And, and I, can we look at one quickly too, Virginia? I wanna show something just quickly for a very short conversation. Um, while we have the groups here. And that is in 102 IB, talking about uh, the definition of programs that could be considered <clears throat> um, accredited. And so we talked a lot about, and I wish Dan was here and Mike, maybe you have input on this, but you know, there was a lot of talk around the, the we can see your screen, Virginia. Um, a lot of talk about programs specifically out of Texas, uh, where teachers may come and they're, they're certified uh, through an ESD or a local level district. Um, and then they obtain a full license in the state of Texas uh, have some period of experience teaching in the classroom with that license, but then if they come to uh, tech Montana, sometimes that issue of the program and how it was set up and not falling under accreditation sometimes causes a hiccup. Um, so really just thinking about teachers who may come from other states, if we look at IB, the language that was there uh, last week, we had talked about adding that is uh, language in there to cover that program that was approved or accredited by the State Board of Education or the state agency, which would happen for those local programs, right? So the state, wherever it is, that state board or state agency would accredit that program, but it might not be a college or university program specifically. Uh, Teach for America could be another place that falls into this. So uh, through further deliberation, there was a suggestion to, to take out that, that 
language that talks specifically about a regionally accredited college or university uh, in that IB, which would then grant that flexibility for an accredited program at the state a, state level, but that might be a program outside of a, a formal college or a university. That should not impact in any way any preparation programs or, or teachers prepared in the state of Montana, but would provide some flexibility for teachers who may come from out of state who may have went through what is quickly becoming a varied uh, set of programs that may be offered nationally. So Jacob, just a couple of notes there, if you will. So um, looking at this, um, the reason why we had to come back to B is there's some potential consideration in four that may need to lead us back um, in chapter four, uh, back over here to re kind of define this. So when you guys will see here later, um, uh, as we'll talk about either today or next week, um, or even you'll be getting kind of a view of it um, before next week, uh, I have a red line version for chapter four, because it is pretty extensive, is um, that if we change some things to address that alternative program, whether we go with lessening the years or what we might do, um, I'm not sure we wanna take a vote yet on our definitions in one until we get everything kind of finalized in all those other chapters that may be connected here. Um, so I was thinking rather than taking a vote, we'll wait till we get everything um, kind of our recommendations in all the other chapters and then just come back here to be sure it all aligns and then we can go from there because there's some and or situations that we're thinking about in chapter four if that makes sense. So Sharon keep keep that in mind I think that is uh, we'll talk about that in four, your question about quality. Um, so this is all I want to look at here, Virginia, was just to, to put forth that that language was under consideration potentially. Um, so notice that as the red lines go out again this week, that was a slight change from last week. <laughs> so then if we can go back to the PowerPoint slide for just a second, Virginia, we'll go down to the chapter four PowerPoint slide. No, go back to the PowerPoint, please. And while they're looking at that PowerPoint, just to kind of address your question, Sharon, that was in the box. I do think that once we get into chapter four is really the heart of the of the um, chapter, if you will, over overall, um, I do think we're going to have product, quite a bit of conversation about how do we strike that balance between maintaining quality and seek, you know, and ensuring that quality while trying to address maybe how do we remove some barriers or provide maybe some multiple ways. So um, I think we're, when you look at the red line version, when you get for four, uh, you'll be looking at some like different alternatives to be thinking about. So I do agree with Jacob. We're gonna probably have some meaty conversation there, probably some in-depth conversation that then will lead us back over there. So I think your question is really um, valid uh, as a lead into that chapter review. So as we think about four, as I have listened to the conversations <clears throat> that have got us to this point, one key theme keeps coming up for me, and that's what we want to we want to try to break down the barriers in licensing while maintaining rules that will help with quality. We don't we don't want to lose quality, but we want to try and break down the barriers. And so we've looked at a lot of other states and sort of their methods. And you know, we've of course had lots of rich discussion here in the group. So so what we'll look at today is a chart that uh, as, a, as a facilitating group, we've tried to put together that strikes a balance of this conversation, uh, breaking down barriers, maintaining quality, um, that could lead us in a direction to really dig into chapter four. So for clarity around that, we're really in this conversation today talking about 410 through 412, 425 and 426, and then a little bit of subchapter 301 that we'll get to related to endorsements. Thinking about what is the core purpose of chapter 57, which is obtaining 
a license, sort of getting your, whether it's your first license in the state or your first license ever, renewing or keeping a license, which we won't really dig in today because a lot of it has to do with renewal units, uh, but advancing a license, right? So what does it take if you have one level of license to kind of move up to the next, what's required to make that step? Um, and the thinking being, if we can knock out those sort of details, then a lot of the rest of chapter four will cascade into place much easier. So if you'll bear with me, I, I will attempt to walk us through this chart in the context of many of the things we've talked about as a group. So if you could open up the chart for me, Virginia, and if, and well, hang on just a second, Virginia, if we could go back. I don't know if it would, just to the slide, if, any, if anybody wanted to open it up on their own, I'd, I'll pause just for a second and let everybody kind of copy down that tiny URL or open it up off the PowerPoint if you have it open on the website. So let's just wait just a minute for anybody. Sometimes easier to see things on your own pay, on screen. <clears throat> okay, so if no one says no, I'm gonna go ahead now and have Virginia switch over. Thank you, Julie, that's it's in the chat now. So we solved that. Okay, let's leave it right there. Um, so we looked at this earlier and we had some conversation. Uh, the in green piece was recommended by John to put in there uh, still for discussion. And then uh, we know there's still some discussion around praxis. So that's why it's highlighted. So that's what the highlighting means at this point. Uh, if you could scroll down just a little bit, Virginia, so we could see right there, that's perfect. So starting at the provisional license piece, Right. So thinking about what's essential for someone to obtain a provisional license in Montana. So what we put forth is that someone who would need a provisional license first has to have a bachelor's degree from an accredited institution. And then they need to be enrolled in a program with a plan to complete that educator preparation program within three years. Now, currently, we talked about that being Montana approved which would mean it, it would be approved by the ARM 102 we just looked at. <clears throat> and they complete the IEFA course, okay? So that's, you're at a school district, you have somebody with a bachelor's degree, you need, you wanna put them in place for, you can give them a provisional license if they're enrolled in a program. This helps on a couple levels with what, with what we've talked about. One, it's a clear plan for someone to get a provisional license. Two, last week we talked about emergency authorizations and there was some discussion around the continual renewal of emergency authorizations and potentially wanting to put a cap on them. So here's why I think this first part of getting a provisional license is beneficial. If you're a district level administrator and you hire someone on an emergency license, you have that freedom still. But then if you think that person is suitable to move into the teaching profession, and that's a path you want them to take, then this provisional license grants you that path, right? Assuming they have a bachelor's degree, they have a whole year of an emergency license to get their EPP program set up with a plan to complete in three years. And it means after one year of an emergency license, they can move directly into a provisional license and have that in place and then have the provisional license for three years while they complete that program. It also means if you look at the next step for this person who's in Montana who may have a provisional license, once they complete their EPP program, if you'll just look to the next side, then they'll be eligible to move into the initial license right away as well, because they will have completed their program from an accredited institution. They will have already completed the IEFA course and then you no know, practices in yellow, we'll have to discuss that. But there's a clear path for at this point for someone who may obtain an emergency license in Montana with a bachelor's degree to move directly into a provisional license, directly into that and whatever the initial license is called at this point, it's a class two. Right. So Jacob, I'd like to yeah. um, first uh, address that green part. <clears throat> and I'm wondering where that's coming from and ask a little bit more in detail about that. Um, because we do have many teachers that um, obtain a class five and complete a plan of study 
that are attending a program, something like uh, governor, uh, Western Governors, um, and that is not a Montana approved accredited EPP. It's an accredited program either through the state that it, it's in in Utah or through um, a, a national accreditation agency like CAPE. And so many of our teachers that uh, do get a provisional license and complete a plan of study are not attending technically what we would call Montana approved accredited EPP. They're attending an approved accredited EPP. But so quick clarification there, Julie and John, I know you're the one who brought this up. If it falls under the definition of an accredited program that's in chapter one that we just looked at, would it not be considered Montana approved? No. Okay. So accredited, those are regionally accredited. They're approved to operate in the state where they exist. And typically they lead to licensure in their home state, right? So we don't, we don't tell people complete your program at MSU and we're going to get you a license in Iowa or Vermont or wherever. Typically we tell them it will transfer, you know, blah, 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 and go through all that. The reason we asked for this to be put in with like the emergency licenses and class fives in particular is under the BPE language, they have to work with a Montana school. On the class five, currently they don't. And Julie, as you said, they can work with Western Governors, Grand Canyon, whoever. We end up working with a lot of people who complete those programs that at the end, they don't meet the requirements for, for licensure for one reason or another. One of the biggest reasons is they don't pass the praxis. And so they come to us and they say, I need help passing the praxis to say, well, you didn't complete our program. You know, we can't, we can't help you with this. You have to go back to wherever you, you graduated from, they'll help you with the test. From our perspective, when we have student, when we have uh, teacher candidates who are working on emergency certificates, to have them work with a school that isn't approved for licensure in Montana doesn't make a lot of sense because the end goal is to get the Montana license. So what we're trying to look at is why wouldn't we have the same process that we have for BPE, which is to work with a Montana accredited school, uh, apply in the class five or in this instance, the provisional license, just like we do when we have a teacher who's adding an endorsement, why wouldn't we have the same requirement for someone who's working on a first time license? So John, a question for you and maybe out to the group then is, uh, when we look at a, a initial license, a class one, a provisional or a class two in, um, standard, um, and they attend a, a program, an EP program that's accredited out of state, um, they can get that license here in Montana um, even though that's not a Montana state accredited program um, because their program they attended was accredited. So we would be treating provisional class five different than how we treat um, class one and class two. Endorsement so love some discussion on that. Endorsement would be the same argument because you can go to another state, get an endorsement and transfer that back. And we already say that for an endorsement, you have to work with Montana program. So why wouldn't we say the same thing for initial license? So BPE, for the BPE internship, you have to work with a Montana institution. It's, it's, in, the, it's in the language. So it seems like class five and BPE should be consistent with each other. So John, I um, ask you, and maybe I need to go back and do a little bit research, but when we look at endorsements, this is chapter three, it's actually 1057-301. Um, I don't see anything in rule that I'm aware of that says you can only attend a Montana school uh, to get your endorsement if you're adding an endorsement. Okay, so, really, Ju so Julie, if we're, ta if we're talking about, what I'm talking about are the emergency certificates, class five, the BPE, you know, where someone doesn't have that license and they're working to getting that license. So with the BPE, they have to work with a Montana institution. It's in the it's in the rule that they have to work with a Montana institution on the BPE program. With the class five, there isn't similar or consistent language. They can work with institutions anywhere. I agree with you. If you get your endorsement in another state, you can transfer that back in. If you get your initial license in another state, you can transfer that back in. But specifically, when we have people working in districts without certification in BPE, they work through us 
class five, they can work through whoever. What, what is BPE, John? I'm sorry. Board of Public Ed. Okay. So when you have a person who has a license in math and we're asking them now to teach English, if they have three years experience, they can come in and get a BPE internship. And actually it really doesn't matter the number of years experience they have will work with anybody. Um, but they can come and work with us. We develop a plan of study, just like you've got, got here. Uh, what we do is we set up a plan for them. They have three years to complete it. Once they complete that, then they get the endorsement. And, they're, and while they're doing that, they can teach in that subject area. So they have permission from OPI to not hit the, um, you know, the, the non-compliance portion of the accountability system. So they, they stay compliant to teach English with that math license while they're adding the English license. So um, how familiar are um, all of you with the internship program? I know you are, John, but I'm not sure maybe the group, I don't know how their level of familiarity of the difference between a class five provisional license, an emergency authorization and an internship. Is that something that would be helpful to put some information uh, for folks to see what the internship is? if not today for next week. Julie, this is Diane. I think it would be helpful. I'm familiar with some internship programs, but I guess I would like to know the extent of those and more information specifically about them. And Julie, given the fact that we answer that question on a daily basis, uh, I think it would be a, a great refresher for everybody um, to know the difference of what those different pieces are. We tend to, everybody tends to think that everything is a class five. Mm -hmm. And so understanding that there is this BPE and what the BPE internship right. is would be great. Right. And I think that the biggest thing here, John, that we just tee off that's going to be important for people as you read it, a significant difference between a class five provisional license and a um, internship is in order to qualify for an internship, you must already hold a Montana license, either class one or class two. So um, that doesn't apply to a class five, but I'm gonna be sure we post that up on the link for over the week for, for you guys to see the application, but just really hone in on the words there uh, because it is a little bit different. It's just another avenue of how you add an endorsement if you're already licensed, but it does not apply to the class five, if you will. Does anyone else have any comments about the Montana approved stipulation for a provisional license of the program that you would complete? Jacob, this is Jewel. Yep, um, Jewel. And I agree with Julie. I think the Montana, we really need to look at that because we need to have the flexibilities to allow for Western governors and some other you know, some other opportunities. So we really need to take a look at that. I agree. Go ahead. Sorry, so I was just looking through, first of all, it's very good to see everybody and I'm really sorry that I was late. I was moving from the Board of Public Ed to, to this meeting this morning. Um, so uh, when we were visiting with our campuses uh, about this advanced student teaching model, one of the things that did come up was the class five. And one of the things that, that we had talked about um, was that the students ed prep program would grant approval uh, for the class five teacher uh, to receive college credit towards degree completion during the time of, of the class five uh, initial uh, provisional licensure. So if we had any, any folks who you know, were meeting their student teaching requirements, one of the things that we put there was that that approval mechanism must be in there. So I don't know if that muddies the water or, or helps us to move forward, but that was something that, that we talked about and, and our, you know, a number of EPPs across the board were involved in that conversation. Just one piece on that, on the Western governor's piece, uh, the one thing that seems a little bit counterintuitive to those of us in, in approved programs, those programs aren't approved. They're not reviewed by anybody in Montana. And so to give someone an initial license 
from a program that hasn't been approved when we're working on a shortage in this area is a is a short hire um, where they can't find somebody else we feel like we can provide a different level of support from our approved programs here in montana we know the players we know the schools uh, it just seems like it when we when we offer that level of support to a licensed teacher um, to get through the BPE internship, to offer that same level of support to someone who's in a in a district that uh, we would really like to be able to to have that opportunity to go out and work with those districts, work with those candidates in the same way that we do with the BPE internship. So we're looking at the fact that uh, Western Governors Grand Canyon they're not ever reviewed by OPI. Um, so they're, it's a really different playing field for those folks when they're out in those positions. This is Diane. I, I remember years ago when I was on the board that Western governors did come to our board meetings. I would like a little bit of um, background on that. Maybe others on the board may remember um, they were interested in getting some type of approval and what happened after that, I'm not sure. Yeah, and you guys, that's just one example of many. <clears throat> we even have some in South Dakota. Um, we have some in Washington. What I share with you is that a lot of times the folks that are enrolling in those plan of studies um, through these approved accredited programs that do lead to licensure in their state, um, and we accept that ex as well for our class one or class two. Um, many of those I think people take because of the virtual option, if you will, um, because of the cost and the, uh, um, the travel. And, and, and so there's a piece there that I, you know, I'm just, I'm just sharing with you guys that, you know, where's that balance between ensuring quality, like John is mentioning, right? And how do we balance that with flexibility to be sure that all teachers that are coming in that have a bachelor's degree and need to complete a plan of study um, have some flexibility and pathways there, not barriers, if you will. So again, just trying to strike that um, balance. And I would tell you that we have a lot of folks that do use uh, uh, entities outside the state of Montana for their class five currently. Nick, go ahead, please, Nick. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, to go back to uh, John's comment um, about the uh, about the support that the UM system provides to their uh, uh, their graduates, uh, we absolutely absolutely acknowledge that and uh, we value that and understand that it's a it's a it's an important piece. But as an employer, um, as as we look at applicants and find that they are not products of the UM system, we understand, wholly understand, that we are going to need to provide those individuals with additional supports. Um, and, and that's, uh, as an employer, that's a risk that we take, and we take fully, uh, fully well knowing that, um, that we won't have that UM support or uh, that our new hire won't have that UM support, and the onus lies on us to provide it. Um, so, so I guess with that, a little bit of a pitch for more, uh, more local control on that, uh, on, on, on if they can get a license, who we hire, um, understanding that uh, we may need to provide some people more support than others. So I, I guess, uh, my thoughts from from the front of an employer trying to find new teachers. Angela, thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you, Nick, um, and and everybody. I really appreciate the the piece about making sure that the the support is provided for the teacher. I, I just think that that is just such a critical piece of, of anything that we do uh, with this and and. Um, with, with chapter 58 and how the district should should do that is, is I think a local control issue. But I think that we are all in agreement that these teachers do uh, need uh, a certain level of support. And I guess, you know, I sit here as an agent of, of the Montana University system, but also uh, aware of the knowledge that in addition to our EPPs, we have tribal college ed prep programs. We have uh, private ed prep programs uh, across the state. And I guess what I would offer is 
Um, if we're falling short, if we don't have these online opportunities that seem readily available for folks from, uh, from Browning to Ecolaca, then let's take this time and I will take this conversation up the ladder so that um, folks know that their university system, their tribal college EPPs and their private EPPs can meet their provisional licensure needs. So I, I, I don't want to sound provincial there, but I think that we have 10 EPPs in Montana. Can we use this opportunity between now and when these would ultimately be approved to give those EPPs a chance to make sure that we have what we need in place here and hold tight to the Montana approved language. Okay, so I'm going to move us past that. It, it sounds like the key sticking point there is if it was Montana approved, is there the same flexibility for potential applicants to complete a program that logistically would be easy for them to do, say 100% online, 90% online, and some of the other online programs such as West, Western Governors that are available? So would, would Montana approved be a barrier for some teachers? That's the question to consider. Uh, and we will come back to that with the larger group. Dan had a comment. Um, thinking about partnerships. Yeah. Uh, so I encourage everybody to read that with the <clears throat> local service centers. The second provisional sort of pathway presented here was put forth to address the issue that we'd seen before. John, go ahead. I'm sorry, I want you. Well, it's okay. I just wanted to, to point out, we're only talking specifically about class five here. Candidates are still able to work with Western Governors, Grand Canyon, uh, Phoenix, Capella, Walden, whoever, uh, as they always have been able to. This is just specific to that class five language. We are in no way arguing that a candidate shouldn't be allowed to complete a program from Grand Canyon or wherever. That, that's not what this discussion from our perspective is about, it's just strictly around this five, you know, this provisional kind of language. So I just want to clarify, we're not trying to say uh, students shouldn't have the flexibility to attend what program works the best for them. All right, thank you, John. And, and it would be people who are already working in the state of Montana too. They would have been hired to have a job. Uh, so they would be working in Montana. <clears throat> so anyway, the second provisional pathways put forth was put forth here to help address the conversation we had around in previous language about teachers who come in who may have had a license in another state, but have let that license expire. Uh, and what the current roadblocks exist, so are around justification of college credit or, because uh, if you come in with an expired license now, you have to have had six hours of college credit within the past five years to get that, right? So that's generally what the language says. So we're putting forth is this. In the case of someone who may come from out of state and they have an expired teaching license, they could come to Montana and obtain a provisional license with proof of that previous license that is expired, completion of the IEFA course, and six hours college credit within the past five years, documentation of that, or completion of 60 hours of professional development activity that's relevant within the last five years, or the candidate could choose to simply pass the praxis in their respective content area and the, the pedagogical praxis test. So that would give someone with an expired license three different options to obtain a provisional license in Montana. Secondly, if they obtain that provisional license, and depending upon what happens with the initial license, but you know, they would obtain that provisional license for one year, and then in most cases, they'd be eligible for the initial license the second, right? <clears throat> Any comments about that? Okay, now I'm gonna move over into the, uh, the initial class two, first tier, whatever we wanna call it, the next uh, to our right license. So again, we're starting 
To obtain this license, someone would need a bachelor's degree from an accredited university. Part of that degree that would have been a completion of a EPP program, including appropriate supervised student teaching and the IEPA course. Now, what we have not determined is if the praxis is still a component of the first license or the initial license. I mean, we, we've, talked, we've talked about that quite a bit. The recommendation from the work group who looked at it was to leave it for the initial license to do away with and for other licenses. So that would be like your, your teacher who's coming right out of your EPP program, the first step, right? Now, if we move down after the or, then we're gonna be looking at teachers coming from out of state, okay? So if I'm a teacher coming from out of state and I have a current non-provisional or or emergency teacher license in good standing, right? And three or less years experience, and I complete the IEFA license, then I'd be eligible for that initial license, right? So if meaning if I come in with a full license, I don't have an, a provisional and I don't have an emergency license. I come in with a full license from another state and three or less years experience, then I can obtain the Montana license. The other option would be for this initial license would be someone who may come in with a national board certification, just a bachelor's degree, and then they complete the IEFA course. So comments on this, and what is our thinking about praxis? Eric has his hand up. Yes, yeah, sorry, just a clarification. The three or less years experience, I'm just double checking that we didn't intend three or more. Three or more. No, because three or more would be the second level with a master's degree. Okay, that's right. I remember we had some discussion around five versus three years. So I just wanted to make sure that I was tracking that. Thank you. <laughs> There's probably some language there that needs to be cleaned up. What we're really trying to capture is people who have zero to three, right? And you're from out of state. Um, you still would be like it's, if you had more than three, but you didn't have a master's degree, you wouldn't be eligible for the second level at this point. But that's what we're trying to capture is really those people with less than three. What's the situation? <clears throat> Angela. Well, thank you. I don't know if this speaks in particular to the, did you want us to speak to the praxis or to the years of experience or to this whole initial licensure piece? We can talk about the whole thing. Well, and I would add, Jacob, what's kind of different from what is current rule, just so that we know, is that highlighted piece in yellow as well as a part of uh, uh, that top bullet around, um, if you will, um, accredited professional education program, which is part of that piece that we talked about in chapter one, that it doesn't say an accredited professional education program at a university or college. It reduces this from three pathways, the traditional, the national board and the alternative, this is reduces it down to two pathways, if you will. Approved preparation program, traditional and or alt, I mean, or alt and national board. And then the second layer of that is the praxis. Those are the differences from current rule, if you will. Okay, Angela, did you have something you wanted to say before we moved on to John? So I do. And then I, it's, it's just something that I think you, it's not going to be a surprise to any of you. I, I think that um, whatever we do with the praxis, whatever we do with the experience here, uh, for me, I think is going to be largely dependent on our ability uh, in a district like Nick's, in a district like Dan, to ensure that these folks, whether they're coming in from out of state or whether they are getting a first time license coming out of one of our EPPs to ensure that they have induction and mentoring support. Um, I, I don't know if this is something we can do alone here. I, I, don't, I, I don't think it's an overreach. 
I, I really think that this is an opportunity for us to ensure that support for X number of years uh, as part of that. And now how a district would do that is entirely up to them. They could use the recess. They could use the recess in conjunction with our EPPs. They could use our EPPs. They could use uh, the learning hub. I just think that we, the devil would be in the details, but I think that there's a real opportunity for us on uh, the, the terminology I was using this morning is, you know, to not only fill the pool, but to also to keep it full with making sure that we're going to, we're going to bring them in. We want them here. We're recruiting them. That's the term I heard today at the Board of Public Ed. We are recruiting out-of-state teachers, and we, we want that to happen through what we're about to do with Chapter 57, and we want that to happen to a larger degree. So how we do that matters, but also how we not only recruit, the, recruit them to our big schools or our little schools in Montana, but to Montana as a whole and then keep them, I think needs to be a part of this. So I would offer that we, we add a bullet for all initial licensees that they have at least, and I, and I put out two years, two years of induction and mentoring support that gets signed off. Um, now, if there's another step to this where we talk to uh, the Chapter 58 people, but I'm not sure how that necessarily blends with, with uh, any out-of-state folks coming in, um, I, I think we should take it but because I think that we have a real opportunity. When we did talk about this as, as something that we could implement, I think that it was widely supported amongst the committee. And I don't think we need to marry ourselves, you know, to, to how it looks or to, you know, those details, but to put language here that would foster that greater retention. So I, I, would, I would love to see a bullet here that says for all initial licensees, in state, out of state, anybody who would be an initial licensee, we're going to support you. And, and we then as an education community, knowing that this would move forward, we could then circle up and say, here's some ways that this could happen and provide it in a very cost effective way um, or zero cost way uh, to our districts across the state to make it happen. Because I think nothing is worse for them than to hire a teacher in and not have the supports in place or supports that they can access and use to keep them. That's not good for student learning. That's not good for student growth. Uh, and, 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 and at the end of the day, I just would ask if, if it doesn't just put us right back where we were, right? Um, so I would just ask that we consider that and then add a bullet in there for mentoring and induction support. Thank you, Angela. John. I, I really like trying to come up with more innovative ways to, to get people from out of state, the licensure in particular. And um, the three years versus five years, I, 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 I like having the three years because it's consistent to the language we have in other places. I, I think we talked about that before. Um, down on the third one, we have national board certification. You said that they could have a bachelor's degree and national board certification, but you didn't mention the licensure. And so if you look at the requirements to receive certification from the national, national boards, you have to have a license, a bachelor's degree, and at least three years of teaching uh, teaching experience. So they really want to fit in this category. They do belong more in the third column where they are currently because they have the three years teaching experience to have a license from another state. Does that make sense? It does, but it, it conflicts with having the master's degree for the second level. Um, but so if we'd, have to, we'd, have, we'd have to clean that up as well. Yeah. But <laughs> couldn't, we, couldn't we look at national boards as an, a value add they have something additional similar to a master's so couldn't that be some kind of a plus you know because yeah so my 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 replacement for the national board in the second column is could we look at adding the language from nasdaq around the interstate agreement act which basically says if you have a license in another state you get to bring that license into the new state you have to still meet requirements and things um, but it, it, it would at least keep that national board. I, I think giving people something more because they've completed the national board uh, makes sense. It, it's a lot of work. It's a valued document. Everybody knows and appreciates it. Um, but because we have three years or less on the one above, it just it seems a little awkward where we have three years or more in, in the second column. So John, are you proposing to say that um, a teacher that is nationally board certified should actually be getting the professional rather than the standard? So it would go into the second level and it would be 
um, nationally board certified uh, in lieu of the masters. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 you know, the people that complete those programs, it, it's a huge undertaking. And yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that there would be a lot of support from folks to give them the advanced, uh, the advanced license compared to the initial. I agree. Um, Jacob, somebody had indicated in the notes to add a bullet about the induction. And I know we've had this conversation, so I think one of the things we should uh, maybe be thinking about, does the induction and mentoring, is that in chapter 55 only, or in chapter 57 only, or both? I say that because um, what Angela, I hear you proposing is that it's not only on the district to provide the mentoring and the support to the teacher at the local level, but it also then becomes a part of their, um, if you will, their responsibility to engage in that in order to keep their license. So if they don't engage in that, then, then they're not gonna have a, um, uh, be able to keep an, an initial light, a, a standard or a, a professional. If they don't get those two years, that's gonna put them back into a provisional um, that where they will have to obtain that mentorship and induction later um, and or, um, and if they've already been through a provisional, then they wouldn't be eligible. So I guess the question for the induction and mentoring that I think is still in the air is where does it live? Is it on the teacher's responsibility as the owner of their, their certificate? Is it on the district's responsibility or where does that lie? So John, I wanna come back to you, but Nick had a, a comment. And so Nick, can you expand on what you put in the chat? Yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, really with that, uh, I, I absolutely support uh, the idea of uh, induction and mentoring program. And Angela, give me a call, I'll, I'll come help you with it. Um, however, I would, uh, I would like to see it elsewhere and not in chapter 57. Uh, just uh, to, to keep licensure, um, for lack of a better word, as simple and as straightforward as possible. Uh, that way, the onus of, of induction and mentoring lie on the district rather than on the teacher and their license. I couldn't agree with that. I am. I would just like to say, I, I think this bears more discussion. This might be one of the things we want to broaden and find more information on. Uh, I don't think of an induction or mentoring program as a burden on a teacher. I think it is a support for a teacher. And so um, I think it's, I think it's a positive thing to look at that from both sides as a requirement for the district to have one for accreditation, and then an opportunity for a teacher to participate that in that as a, a pathway to uh, the next step in licensure and to be sure they get off to a good start. And, uh, you know, I've seen Montana come together and make these things work before uh, without a huge amount of time and energy. I, and I do know that we're getting more and more folks from out of state that come to a new state, a new, um, a new setting, and are struggling. And so uh, if we could take our collective wisdom here and put it together toward a program that would be a support for a teacher and free of cost for a teacher. I don't want this to be a burden that further erodes teachers' salary. I want it to be something that teachers would appreciate now with teachers helping to design the program and so it isn't just something that's outside of what teachers do but it's an important part of what they know they need to be successful and not burdensome in terms of time or extraneous things that aren't needed so I, I'd I'd like teachers to 
play an, uh, an important role in the design of this. I think it could be uh, could lead to a more positive uh, first few years for many of our teachers. I just uh, heard from our teacher in Missoula, our president in Missoula, and that's a large district, and I'm thinking of smaller districts more so here. She said that they put in a mentoring and teacher support program, and it is the best thing they've done, and that teachers are loving it and feeling supported by it, and it's working very successfully there. So I'll take it upon myself to work and find a few examples of programs that are working, but I'll just say I would want it to be free. I would want teachers to be involved in the design and implement, implementation of it. So it isn't a burden, but it works for teachers and it works for districts. Yes, and Mike is saying that they have paid mentor programs. Yes, that's often negotiated in the, uh, the, the collective bargaining agreements where teachers can have an opportunity uh, to be paid for mentoring and then mentees, if there's extra time involved, they're paid for that as well. So it's an opportunity to enhance those first few years and make them better, not just for teachers, but of course for students. That's what I'd like to see. I think we need more work on it, but I wouldn't want it to go uh, by the wayside at this time. I think we need to work together on it. Sharon, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. I, I agree with Diane. And I think as an additional um, incentive here, those items could have either, um, well, renewal units attached to them. So that actually helps the teachers um, advance in their license renewal as well. So are we talking about you guys almost another level between provisional and initial? What I mean by that is, um, you get this provisional one that's listed here almost becomes like a, another term, if you will. It's like, a, I don't know what word because I don't want to say emergency because that means a whole other thing here, but like an um, alternative license or something. I don't know what word to use because then in the middle, you're saying everybody um, prior to get an initial license um, goes through almost like a, a provisional level two, if you will, or a pre-initial or after two years of signed off mentorship um, and induction, they get a standard license. So it's almost like something in between those two. So that's kind of hear what I, I hear you guys talking a little bit about, but I don't know if I've captured that right. Uh, Corinna. Wouldn't that be an uh, after the initial license that before they go into the provisional or before they go into, you know, I, I like that we need to do more with mentoring, but I, I think we shouldn't put that before the initial license, maybe after. Or I guess provisional then before the initial, I, I guess I understand what you're saying is that before they get their regular license, they should have had some mentoring. Is that, is that what you're saying? Um, Rena, that's what I'm kind of understanding. Yes, but I'm not sure if I'm clear on what I'm hearing. Diane kind of captured and, and Angela and Sharon as well. And now you, Karina, and, and some, some of the other conversation here is um, we need to kind of dig into that a little bit more because in like Minnesota, and I also know like in Colorado, um, even if you've gone through an EPP accredited program from a university and have a um, student teaching and have passed your practice and done all of that, they put you in a provisional. And then you have to have three years of experience before you go to what they call a professional license. So there's a different level there. Um, and so some of those other systems have different tiers, if you will, but they call this provisional something else, right? They call it another step of like an emergency license, if you will. So I hear people talking a lot about that. So I think you guys are making a good point. We should bring some more information and post it on the website around internship, but I'm also adding my list to add some more information around induction and mentoring as it ties to licensure. Is that correct for further yeah. consideration? So immediate considerations is to look back at the report we had on tiered systems. So Minnesota does have something that's actually with their first professional license, which is a portfolio teachers have to complete. There's a similar program in New Mexico that's more, it's very closely aligned to the evaluation framework, whatever their version, it's really their version of Danielson's evaluation framework. Uh, and I can tell you that in New Mexico, I think it's already under litigation uh, since it's been put in. 
uh, as an extra barrier. My question would be this, Angela, is what is the benefit for implementation of the program if it goes into the chapter? Meaning, does it need to be in the chapter to do it? Because you talked about doing it? And why can it not be done without it being in the chapter? So I, I think it's it's one of those things, um, Jacob, and I appreciate the question. I, I think what we're looking for here is, is a way to eliminate barriers, bring folks in from out of state, continue with the successful movement of folks from our EPPs into that initial licensure. Um, and I think that it um, is critical to making sure that with any person who would teach Montana students for the first time, that they would have a structure of support to ensure to a greater likelihood that they would stay in the district that they're at or um, in the state of Montana as a whole with their teaching license. So I, I guess part of what I think you're asking is, is that. I think another part of, of what you're asking is, can we just put it out there and assume or pray that it might happen. I think our school, our school superintendents, our school principals, our school trustees are amazing people and they are doing an amazing job in, in serving their schools and their communities and uh, answering the call of, of public education. Um, and I don't want to add another layer here, but I don't see it as that. I, I think that if we could put the language in here it would ensure to 100% or pretty close uh, certainty that we would have a plan of mentorship and induction. And there might be several of those, but we would understand that it would happen for anybody coming into Montana or coming through the Montana EPP system to teach our students. And we could do that through a rule to make sure that it happens more strategically than if we just leave it out there. Now, if, if we want to look at it for, for chapter 55 and ramp up the collection of what's happening, maybe we look at it there. I think that it belongs here with licensure. We do something like a 2A, maybe a 2I, like a second interim or something like that until they get uh, the two years of, um, of mentorship and induction. But I guess I would ask the whole committee at the end of the day, what have we done if we've loosened up We've gotten rid of the practice. We've gotten rid of the, the number of years of experience coming in. Um, we, we've prepared our teachers so well, even in our Montana EPPs, um, and, and set them into a classroom and not provided them a, stru a structure that we can be certain of, that it's going to be delivered uh, for one or two years or maybe even more. What have we done at the end of the day to address our recruitment issue? And our retention issue that was that was and that's how it was presented today during the board of public education if we haven't supported them i presented some national center of ed, ed statistics eight percent of our of our teachers leave the profession in a year another eight percent leave their job their existing job in a year so we're facing 16 percent retention in any given year and this is pre-pandemic stats from the ncs so i guess i would just say that, that this is where it belongs. I think that it, it needs to have a home. Now, one of the other things that I said uh, today during the Board of Public Ed meeting, Jacob, was perhaps we need to come together with the Chapter 58 folks too to see what that induction and support looks like for Montana EPP completers. Maybe we need to have a, a you know separate plans and, and all of that. But I think that we can come up with something to Nick's point and to what Dan said that would meet the needs, not be more work, but really be an intentional deliberate, well thought out mentoring and induction uh, support system where they develop cohorts of folks entering their same field or their same endorsement area. They develop cohorts of people entering their, their own community uh, in, in a small town or in a big town in Montana. It doesn't have to look the same. I think we can come up with good quality models that um, districts can sustain and that the teachers can access. And I think the home for it is in chapter 57. So um, people who are in districts, Nick, you expressed your opinion. Corinna, you're in a district. 
um, do you view this as another layer of something, or how do you view it? Well, I have conf I I believe we should have it, and we do. We have a strong mentoring program here for Browning Public Schools. Um, I don't know if that's the case around the state, however. So I, I I do believe we should have it. Whether or not it should be in in here, I think if we had it in here, then they know they have to get it done and they have to do it. Um, but that's on is a district going to comply? And then does that hinder an employee that's trying to get licensed? And so that's the only the only thing I wonder about if they're going to if they have the capability if they're going to pay people to be mentors if they have the money to I know we talked about you know giving districts maybe money to do that so that that would be my only concern about putting it in here but as far as having a mentor program I think we need to continue to have that and instill it in, across the state so Corinna you bring up a good point so currently everything that's listed here and that's in current chapter it lies with the responsibility of the individual of getting their license. If you add a mentorship layer, does that take some of the responsibility off the individual and put it on to the district to do in order for that individual to, to obtain their individual license? Angela. I guess I would say that it does. <laughs> and I think that it should. I mean, I think that we're hearing from district superintendents uh, at, at, you know, mass meetings, we're hearing from them at Board of Public Ed meetings, uh, every conversation that I go to, we're talking about their struggles to recruit and retain teachers. And so I think it should involve a layer of responsibility on both ends here, on the licensees and to participate and to seek out whatever is available and we could create those before this would come up. We could strengthen what's there, have a group come together. But I, but I think that it should. I think that some of the responsibility here does lie uh, within the district, these districts that are, are seeking these emergency authorizations year in and year out. These folks who are using these class five folks year in and year out. I think there's a shared responsibility here to mitigating those needs outside of just saying, we're gonna get rid of the praxis and we're gonna get rid of uh, experience requirements coming in for folks uh, from out of state. So I think that it's shared and I think that there, that's important that it is. But what I guess I want to tell folks is I, I don't think that there's one right way to do this. I don't know what it would look like. I think that we are innovative leaders in Montana and we could come up with a way uh, or several ways that districts could exercise that valued local control and employ this. In, in a way that would support the teachers that, that work where they are. Um, there's gonna be no, no one size fits all to this. And we don't want it to be more work. We want this to be a support mechanism. And I would hope that districts would welcome it so that they could, could get to a different place with their educator recruitment and educator re re ret retention struggles. So Angela, uh, Corinna, you had your hand up. Did you wanna say something? I have a follow up to Angela. But uh, go ahead. I'll let you. So, so first of all, I got, I 100% don't disagree with the fact that teachers need support in putting it in place. But, but the, the point that I want to clarify here is, let's, let's assume I'm, a, I'm a teacher who comes in and I get my license and I meet everything right and then I have this mentorship licenses and my district doesn't have something in place or doesn't sign off on this, but because they don't have anything in place, then that's out of my control. And so is that, is that a limiting variable for me as an individual to get my license when, I'm do, when I've done everything I need to do, but then I'm hampered by someone else. So that, that adds a, like adding that adds a layer here of, of a stipulation that is different than everything else that's here. Meaning it's out of, it is some ways out of the control of the individual of getting, keeping and advancing their license. Um, so, is that is that that's just for consideration as to does it does it change sort of what is the purpose of chapter 57 and something different does it lie somewhere else diane what i would just say is that in my many years of watching schools around montana 
<clears throat> and hearing from our teachers. There are some fabulous mentoring and induction programs. And then, although it's in, it's already in accreditation standards, there are some non-existent programs. And so that's my concern. We have a churn of our teachers who come in so hopeful they got a new job and then for maybe they choose or maybe their employer chooses because we have such a liberal, um, you know, a, a tenure provision can go through that first three years many times in many districts and never be assured that you have the support and help of your district. So it's, it is, um, we have kind of an interesting thing in Montana where we have those programs. Um, sometimes they're so minimal and uh, that they're almost non-existent. I'm looking for support for teachers that will help teachers. And, um, and if they understand that they have to participate, I would want the fact that maybe a school district doesn't have the, the program in place, because that will happen sometimes, that we could consider or talk about what else, what else? Could it be on the OPI hub? Could it be something where, just options. I don't, I think we have it now in other places and I can tell you it's not happening well everywhere. And I want support for our teachers, free to our teachers, helpful to our teachers. I wanna do what we can to make them successful for our students. And without it being overly cumbersome, I don't want that either. So I'm sitting in the middle saying we have it already in standards. It's not happening as it should be. Yet we're real worried that we don't have enough teachers. We're losing teachers. We have enough teachers actually in Montana that are prepared to fill vacancies, but still we're suffering from the huge turnover. And I, I think every time a, a teacher loses their spot or decides they have to go elsewhere that they may look on as being a failure and kids will have yet more turnover. So I want what we can do to support our teachers in an affordable way. And um, I think that some districts are doing beautifully and other districts are doing almost nothing. Thank you, Diane. Let's, uh, let's move on and talk about the practice real quick. Uh, so we have continuing into next week. Um, Again, the initial recommendation from the group who looked at this was Praxis should stay in place for that first time license, really, uh, for teachers obtaining their first license, really out of, right out of the EPB program. Um, does anyone have thoughts about that being yes, no? Uh, where are we at now after reading some of the literature and, and digging deeper into it? Go ahead, John. Yeah, I've, I've thought a lot about this, and obviously, practice is something that, that we think a lot about with our program. And there was a comment that was, that was made uh, early on in this process that um, maybe practice wasn't uh, entirely necessary for everybody um, or anybody, I think the comment was made. And, and I think... Um, Praxis does tell us some things. Um, you know, looking at the data that Julie shared, it appears that there are maybe some areas in Praxis that, that need some deep dive thinking. The fact that our world languages have a 20% pass rate is pretty ridiculous. Um, and then we have some areas that have 100% year after year after year. So, you know, looking at cut scores and things like that, I mean, that, that's one thing. And that's what the Praxis Committee does. Um, so whether, you know, praxis is something that as a state we decide people should or shouldn't do. I've also been hearing uh, in our conversations with, with, we've had some folks from out of state um, to ask them a little bit about the praxis. And, you know, I'm licensed in North Dakota, Minnesota, and thinking about coming in as, as when you have teaching experience, you've got your degrees. I, I, I can't remember if it was Dan who made the comment. Um, but that, that they're hearing from the teachers that it's almost a slap in the face to make someone take an initial licensure test with all of that experience. And so that really starts to sit with me in a different way, thinking about not what the test is, but thinking about what the test represents to someone else. And if it's a test for an initial license, uh, I think 
having it as, as an initial licensure test versus a requirement for any license in the state. It depends on how you look at differently. On the flip side, having worked in licensure in other states, it often is a requirement that your state testing license goes with the license, regardless of what you bring into that process. So I, I just kind of say all that to say, I, I think there's a lot of different things to talk about here, um, but I, I can't get that teacher comment out of my head that it's kind of a slap in the face to have to prove that you know your content when you've been teaching it for five, 10, 20 years. Karina. No, I, I agree with what John's saying. And then I, I thought of, I start looking at it and it, I just immediately practice is, you know, who, when you're a teacher, does dictator of Mongolia really represent, <laughs> you know, how good of a teacher you are? But I did, I do see where it says, or, and I like that you, we added that, that it has three or less years of experience and, and positive good standing experience but like that or piece as long as it's not an both does that make sense but I, I i truly have a problem with praxis altogether but that's just because of the number of people i have that, that i work with that it, are really good teachers and can't tax past the praxis. Yeah, so there's, you know, four consideration uh, there to think about. We haven't had any ideas put forth. There could be other forms of competency that could even go in this first layer potentially. Um, but we do know that teachers can get their license in Montana without passing the practice. There are ways to do that. Um, but other, there could be some other forms of competency that could be listed here as well. Um, and we do know that McCall, next week when she comes back, she had, you know, we put her on the spot and we haven't got back to it. Uh, she had a comment about keeping practices in place for out-of-state teachers as well. So we'll want to give her a forum to present why that may be um, the feeling from her point of view. Let me go ahead and walk through the rest of this. If I had a chance to look at it for points of consideration in our last 10 minutes. So we've looked at this initial license. Um, I think we'll add, we, we have some stuff to add in for next week, thinking about maybe there's a, a 1A and a 1B or an IA and IB, thinking about the mentorship piece to put in there so we can look at it. But if you, if you move through that, then you move into deciding the second level, which would be a master's degree meaning, and you would have completed your EPP, you have a current license, so that could be a current license in state or out of state, uh, that's, that's good, and three or more years experience, and of course, completion of the IEPA, um, or you could be a national board certified teacher and complete the IEPA and you would be able, eligible for the second level license. <laughs> so really what that, you know, what that does is, if you have a master's degree, and you're in state, you complete an EPP, you've got a license. After three years, you can move to the second level. If you're coming from out of state, uh, you have more than three years, you have a current standing license and a master's degree, then it's really, we're, we're accepting reciprocity for it, right? Like show us your license, show us you completed an EPP program. We trust that you're eligible to teach in Montana at this level. We will also talk about endorsements and adding endorsements as we move forward. Uh, this is a big piece. So currently in Montana, if you want to, if you have a license and you want to add an endorsement to it, you have to go through through a university program to add that endorsement. Um, the question will be: Are there other methods that could grant teachers the ability to add that endorsement? The first one could be if a teacher was a, if, you know, for consideration. If this teacher was able to pass the content area practice associated with the endorsement she wants, is that demonstration enough that the endorsement could be added? Uh, the third one that I'm gonna to jump to would be would, would 60 hours of, of approved professional development in the activity and the content area potentially be enough? 
to add the endorsement. And the second one to consider for adding the endorsement um, would be if a teacher taught for three years in that area, then could the endorsement be added? And this one's really specific because of this. So in our accreditation, I think teacher, you know, you really you've got kind of three years in the accreditation process before what I say you get put on the bad list, right? You sort of get yellow flagged for three years, and at the end of three years, you still have a teacher out of position, then you're then you're in trouble. But if if I'm a, a school leader and I have a teacher who I need to put in a in a place to teach and it's out of her endorsement area, uh, that gives me three years to essentially evaluate the effectiveness of that teacher in that position. If after three years, then they're still effective and I wanna leave them in that position, could the state of Montana then make them eligible to get that endorsement? And then that teacher is no longer out of, out of place. If in three years as a school leader, I see that person's not effective in that, that in reality, should that person receive the endorsement anyway? So, um, that would be another path potentially to consider for that. These are our big buckets in four that we have to really get clear. Uh, I am checking out the chat quickly. And it seems to be, you know, we need that there's some support for thinking about praxis or something else uh, for that initial license for a teacher who's unlicensed. And I think we have yet to hear proposals for that. So if anybody had any proposals to send over through the week to think about what could be there, we could put that language in for consideration. John? Yeah, I just want to uh, point out that um, one of the one of the strengths of our current system is that we have multiple measures. We have their content GPA from the coursework they've taken. We have a cooperating teacher during their supervised student teaching experience who says they have the content, and the praxis is that third third piece to the the puzzle. Um, I don't have a proposal for something different. I, I really want to speak in support of that, though, that there may be an additional measure or a different way to look at competency. Um, and I also want to make another push. We're no longer existing under No Child Left Behind, which is where all of these requirements really started. Can we take this as a chance and as an opportunity as a state to move beyond No Child Left Behind and really come up with something that we want to license teachers that shows they know their content? But what I heard from Dan and what I've heard from the other administrators is we need people who know how to teach. And if the content isn't 100%, we can help them with the content. We can help them learn that. We can help, you know, dial that in and figure it out a little bit better. But part of our licensing process, in addition to the content, if we could have some kind of a measure that really somewhat measures whether they, they have uh, potential to be a good teacher, and I'm using the word potential really intentionally, and that's because a license does not indicate that you're a good teacher. It does not indicate that you're an effective teacher it indicates that you're ready to, to show that you are. And that's where I think that district piece comes in. So our job at the university isn't to give you people who we guarantee are gonna be great teachers. Our job is to give you people with great potential who've met a minimum threshold. That license is the, is the proof that they've done that. And then the administrators are really the ones who determine, yeah, this person's great, they're gonna come back next year. So. I say all that just as I, I would love to see us be innovative and, and come up with something that isn't just the praxis, the content score, and, and, and a thumbs up from a cooperating teacher. And I apologize for not having a great recommendation to throw to you. I think if there was a great recommendation already there, we would already be doing it, Jacob. Well, you've got a week to think of one, so. Okay, I, I, will, I will just only focus on that. Yeah. Angela, go ahead, uh, please. Well, I see potential. I, I really am liking what John just said, and I see, see real potential then in maybe melding our two conversations, the one that he just suggested and the one around this induction and mentorship, I mean, because he's right on. I mean, just because you have a license doesn't mean that 
you are going to be a good teacher, but how do we do something here that would allow students to finish up through their EPPs, which might need to be embedded in chapter 58? How do we do something here for these folks coming in from out of state, seeking licensure in Montana to get them to that place that we can attest that they are good teachers. And if a superintendent says, oh gosh, yeah, they've got the pedagogy down, but they might be short a little bit of the content, here's where we need to point them so that we can get to a different place with that, with that piece. So I think that there's two pieces here of, of, of things that can happen to better support teachers in state, out of state, first time or not into uh, the classroom and keep them there. Okay, Jacob, do you want me to bring it home here in the last three minutes? Or are you are you please, able to no, get us? Please land the plane for us, Julie. Let's <laughs> Yeah, wishful thinking. Uh, you guys, um, we're definitely gonna work really, really um, hard to get this video up immediately to our colleagues um, who were not able to join us today. Um, I think this has been a really in-depth, good conversation that is going to be able to give you guys kind of that um, jumping off spot to dig into chapter four, um, sub-chapter four, I'm sorry, uh, pieces here in a really thoughtful way. So what we will be doing is working to get this um, video recording up in notes as soon as possible for our colleagues so that they have as much time as they can get uh, to get ready next week. Because what we're going to do over the week here, you guys, I'm going to put some more information on our website about internship, about mentorship and induction. Also take a look at being sure we have some things around. Um, again, we might need to recycle what we've had, but some of the um, tiered systems or other kinds of states that use um, certain kinds of uh, different levels, if you will, like Minnesota. Um, and then we're gonna be putting up the red line version of chapter four. And so uh, as you get that and you start looking through that, Jacob has led you through a really good conversation of some of those places that are going to help you lean in on those rules to try to unpack them and understand them from this lens, if you will. I realize once you start looking at rule, it can become really kind of like, so if this, then this, then this, and it starts to kind of lead that way. So um, uh, I think this conversation has been super helpful and really can launch you into that conversation next week. When we look at the calendar, we only have two more weeks and the the chapter four is going to be our big lift um so anything we could do to provide additional resources out there sounds like john's going to come back to us committed to to thinking about competencies how we meet multiple measures of measuring competencies um and i just want to thank you all for the incredible conversation today um and um i think it's been very beneficial from my point of view so thank you guys for that Hi, Julie, this is Crystal. I'm actually here for the last few minutes. If I could just say one thing at the end here, <laughs> I'm bouncing from meeting to meeting. I just wanted to say that um, I presented about chapter 57 to the Board of Public Ed and just had my unusual cases. Um, all three of them passed. So I um, just want you to hear and see that the board is really receptive to change and they're looking for that. Um, it was a long process, but we got through them all. And, you know, they're really looking to this task force to help with that. And um, we're really, really receptive. So I just wanted to end that on that really positive note as well. Um, and just want to thank you all. And I look forward to hear, uh, listening to the whole conversation. And we'll see you next week. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all.